Hello, and welcome to the competition series, where we dive deeper into some of the themes we began to unpack during the 2022 State of American Business event. Throughout this series, we are exploring how competition propels our country and world toward a brighter future of growth, solutions, and opportunity. And if you've missed or want to rewatch any of the State of American Business programming, you can find it on uschamber.com. Today's focus is on competition in the marketplace. It's this spirit of competition that brings the best ideas to life and to customers and communities everywhere. It incentivizes people to take big risks and persevere through failures. It motivates people to start and grow businesses. It enables companies to go public and create wealth for others. And it's the process that has allowed this country to build the most innovative, resilient, and dynamic economy in history. Despite all of this, we have leaders who think the government needs to step in and impose a heavy hand. Our conversations today will focus on the state of competition within our economy. First, we'll take a data-driven look at our nation's competitive landscape. Next, we'll examine the role of the Federal Trade Commission and the agency's recent actions against competition. Then we'll conclude by discussing how stable and predictable rules can support our dynamic economic ecosystem. These conversations will provide insights into how businesses can evolve, disrupt, and compete to serve customers, solve problems, and strengthen our society. Enjoy the program. very pleased to have with us today FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips. Commissioner Phillips joined the FTC back in 2018. Prior to that, he was Senator John Cornyn's Chief Counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Commissioner Phillips, it's good to be with you this morning. It's great to be here with you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Well, last summer, the President issued an executive order on competition, and that executive order suggested that our economy is over-concentrated and perhaps that we have a monopoly problem. Now we see the administration is actually trying to tie this narrative to inflation. Uh, from your perspective, what is the relationship between competition and inflation? Sure, and let me just caveat what I'm about to say. This is just my own view, not necessarily the view of the commission. I'll start with the following. A lot of the conversation about competition and concentration is somewhat misguided. First, concentration, how a market looks, can be an impact of the competitive dynamic as opposed to a cause, an effect, not a cause. And second, a lot of the conversation is based on studies that don't look at what we consider to be antitrust markets. That is where the competition happens. When you're doing antitrust, you're looking at what is the competition competitive dynamic. So for example, we might see concentration at a broad national level in retail as national chains or big box stores grow but they grow by entering markets where they decrease concentration and they increase competition. In terms of inflation, the argument is deeply counterintuitive. For starters, they're much more obvious drivers of what we're seeing in the market today, which is very, very bad. And those drivers have to do with the traditional drivers of prices, that is supply and demand. We've had demand shocks, including labor. We've had, uh, excuse me, supply shocks, including labor. We've had demand shocks. Um, there is a lot going on in the economy worldwide having to do with COVID, very little of which has to do with competition. In fact, you haven't seen dramatic changes either in the capacity or interest of corporations in making money or market structures. What we have seen is COVID, and that appears to uh, be driving some of the real problems that we see. So just to stay with this topic for one more second, if, if competition is not really directly related to the debate around inflation today, there is a conversation within competition policy circles about whether we're looking at these things in terms of the role of the consumer, uh, the role of the producer. There's also, I think, concerns about whether or not a adjustment to the way we do antitrust might actually you know, increase inflationary risk. Uh, any thoughts about how antitrust should look at prices in the market? Well, antitrust always needs to be focused on prices. Part of the concern that I have is a lot of the proposals, um, mostly adopted in a political environment aimed at zero price markets, 
um, may have the effect of raising prices. So taking the focus off of consumers, right, and looking at other distributional issues will allow prices to rise in favor of other goods. I don't think that's good. By the same token, pursuing policies that increase liability for lowering prices, predatory pricing, the Robinson Patman Act, the list goes on. Antitrust reformers are very focused on corporate power. They don't like big companies, whether they're good for consumers or not. What I think antitrust needs to continue to do is focus on the welfare of consumers. We are in an inflationary environment. The poor are hurting the most. People are getting hurt. They can't pay their bills. Taking the focus off price right now is the wrong direction. Let's turn uh, and talk a little bit about the work of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, it's no secret the chamber has been pretty critical in recent months uh, with the direction the agency is headed. Uh, I want to take a couple minutes and talk about mergers. There's lots going on right now in the merger space. We read the headlines that perhaps merger filings are at record levels. Uh, is the legal framework for merger review sound in your opinion? So I think fundamentally the answer to that is yes, right? I am for vigorous enforcement of the Clayton Act. I support, support the overwhelming bulk, if not all, of the merger challenges that we undertake. But neither the Clayton Act, nor the hart scott Rodino Act, nor good policy call for getting rid of all mergers. They call for stopping and giving the government the opportunity to stop the ones that are likely to be bad. But most mergers are likely either to be pro-competitive or at least competitively ne neutral. And what I don't think we want are policies that either have the practical impact or the intent of condemning most mergers or throwing sand in the gears of M&A activity generally. In addition to the particular effect in a given case, you also have the reality in America, which we've had for a long time, of the beneficial effects of the market for corporate control. M&A activity not only is a means for companies to grow, but the competition for companies can stoke competition. And that's something we don't want to lose. We've called um, for information with the Department of Justice uh, to reconsider the merger guidelines. That's a very important process. And everybody watching should get involved, just as all Americans should get involved in giving their input. Um, I think there's some areas where we might consider doing things differently. Uh, what we've been doing, the work we've been doing on Acquisitions of nascent competitors, I think, is important work uh, that deserves more study. There are other areas, too. Uh, but no, I don't think we need a fundamental rewrite. And I don't think we should start from a place where we look at all mergers as negative. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that that is true. And I don't have it in front of me, uh, Commissioner, but I believe that the deadline for submissions on the horizontal and verger vertical guidelines, uh, RFI, somewhere in mid-March. Is that not correct, sir? That sounds about right. Uh, Commissioner Wilson and I called for as much time as we can provide, um, but it is very important that people provide the input so that we get the right answers um, to the questions that we're asking. Well, if the merger framework from a legal perspective is sound, how about the process? One of the things that we're hearing these days because of the number of transactions that are going through the system uh, is that perhaps some of the agency staff are intentionally drawing out or being non-responsive to the various mergers that are obviously under time-sensitive deadlines. Uh, the process in the past has been one where I think there's been a lot of good faith by both the parties who are trying to complete a merger and giving the government a chance to review. Obviously, the government's not always going to agree with merging parties, but anything you might say about ensuring that that process does move forward to ensure that either the government makes a decision that it wants to block the merger, whether or not the parties can come to some kind of terms that would alter the conditions around the merger, or ultimately to clear and give clarity that mergers that are proposed are not a concern to the government. So let me start with a point I made a moment ago, which is the point of merger control, the point of the Clayton Act, the hart scott Rodino Act, and so forth, is to allow the government the ability to stop mergers that are likely to lessen competition. Think of them as bad mergers. The point is not to throw sand in the gears of merger markets generally. Where we are pursuing policies that aim at stopping mergers that are bad, that's good. But where we are aiming policies at raising the cost of introducing uncertainty, um, stopping mergers that are not, um, there I think we're going in the wrong direction. What we need to aim at is efficiency, certainty for merging parties, 
um, and efficacy uh, in achieving our you know, statutory mission. What I worry about, increasingly, I'm seeing not closing investigations, just leaving people um, not to know what the answer is. I don't think that's good. I worry about wasting precious government resources right, on mergers that are unlikely to be problematic. I don't think that's a good way for us to spend our resources. I think it's not fair to taxpayers. I think it's not fair to merging parties. Um, I also, you know, you mentioned settlements. Uh, settlements are part of the scheme envisioned by Congress in the Hart Scott Rodino Act. And I do worry that, for instance, with our prior approval policy, we are undertaking um, measures that get us out of the business of trying to solve problems before they happen. I think that's the wrong way to do it. Sometimes litigation is the answer, and we should always be willing to go to court if that's what's best for the public. But where you can resolve, let's say, a small part of a merger or an easily separatable, a separable asset, um, I think that's something we absolutely ought to consider. Let's take the conversation a little broader than mergers. There has been debate on Capitol Hill about the need to change our antitrust laws, and there are voices calling for the FTC itself to enter into competition rulemakings. Uh, what are your thoughts on the need to make changes to our antitrust laws outside of the merger space? So let me start with the legal question, what Congress is doing. And of course, it's Congress that makes the laws, and that's very important. So Congress gets to set fundamentally uh, the policy direction framework that we as antitrust enforcers enforce. Um, I think the important thing for Congress to focus on uh, where they're considering changes to the law isn't whether a law negatively impacts companies that Congress, let's say, doesn't like. The focus ought to be what is best for competition and what is best for consumers. We don't want to adopt laws that simply hinder people that for whatever reason aren't popular. We want laws that make consumers' lives better, that make Americans' lives better. That, to me, ought to be the focus. Um, I'm worried about harm to competition. I'm worried about harm to consumers as well. With respect to rulemaking, let me start with this. My view is, and I've spent a lot of time looking at this, the FTC does not have legal authority to make competition rules. This was a theory concocted in the 60s. Uh, there was one court that blessed it. I don't think it's a very well done decision. And I don't think it's consistent with the law as we understand it today. I also don't think as a policy matter that giving, you know, three to five unelected bureaucrats, you know, people like me, uh, control over virtually the entire economy, which is very much contemplated in the president's executive order when it talks about FTC rulemaking. I don't think that's the right direction. These are legislative judgments. And even if Congress wants to make a mistake, um, those are mistakes for Congress to make. Some of the conversation that I've seen in the EO and elsewhere, and to be clear, I think there are a lot of good things in the president's executive order on competition as well, but a lot of the conversation seems to be taking the word competition or the legal body of law we call antitrust and just imposing regulation. And what we know from history is that a lot of regulation doesn't favor competition. It may achieve other goals that are worth achieving, but people seem to talk these days as if whatever regulation we impose in the name of competition will help competition. Not only do I not think that's right, I think it's more likely to be wrong uh, than right. And I think we need to keep those things in mind. Just quickly following up on that, when you talk about the, the role and distinction of the law between kind of the traditional function of antitrust versus, versus regulation, uh, what role do you see for more vigorous enforcement of the antitrust laws as they are? Sure. And just so the audience is tracking, part of the move now contemplated in the executive order is to move antitrust, which for 130 years has been adjudicated, right? Courts have taken specific looks at transactions or markets or business practices, um, very fine, uh, you know, cutting with a razor, if, if you will, um, and moving it to a one-size-fits-all regulatory model. I think that is the wrong path. As far as vigorous enforcement, again, I said I'm a fan. I think there are times where, consistent with our congressional mission, uh, we need to intervene, and I think we need to be willing to do that. That's fine. That's within the model that we have. But just pivoting off 
to a regulatory model where we're imposing broad rules um, and we're not thinking about the consequences or studying how the business practices at play operate in that market, I think is the wrong direction. So bringing this conversation full circle, I think what we've heard here today is a lot of things that suggest that the conversation has been focused in the wrong direction. When we talk about competition in the market, where do you think the policy conversation needs to be redirected? So I think the harm to consumers needs to continue to be our focus. It's no accident that a lot of where antitrust law and policy came out of was a high inflation environment. People saw then, as they are seeing today, the really negative effects that high prices can have on consumers. That's not all we look at, but it's a focus that we need to continue to have. We need to look at markets, not industries, markets. And we need to see where they're not working. That's what the antitrust laws are all about. They're about sussing out conduct that is preventing the market from working. Um, and where it doesn't work, it hurts people. Um, and stopping that conduct. I think that needs to be our focus. Let me be clear about something. Um, one of the critiques that you hear today is that antitrust has not focused sufficiently on labor. But what have you seen in the last five years in the Obama administration with the HR guidelines, in the Trump administration bringing no coach enforcement and more conversation to non-competes? These are areas that we, through a litigation lens, ought to be looking at. These are discussions we need to have. And I think where labor markets are broken and it violates the antitrust laws, we need to look at that. But moving to a model where we replace innovation, replace competition, replace low prices with regulation just for the sake of it, I think that's the wrong path. Well, Commissioner, you've given us a lot to think about and take forward with today's session. Uh, really appreciate you being with us today and sharing those top line views on competition in the market. Next up, we have our senior economist, Curtis Dubay, uh, who will lead us into a conversation about some new empirical evidence that kind of distinguishes the difference between concentration in the market and market concentration, which, as you've just pointed out, are two fundamentally different things. Commissioner Phillips, the Chamber appreciates, again, you being here with us today, and thank you. We look forward to continuing the dialogue and conversation. Thanks again for having me. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Sean and Commissioner Phillips. We're gonna shift gears now and take a deep dive into what the data tells us about what's going on in the economy when it comes to concentration and competition. With us today is Dr. Robert Kulik, Associate Director at NERA. Welcome, Robert. Please tell us what your empirical research tells us about what's going on with concentration and competition and what it means for policymakers going forward. Well, thanks, Curtis. You know, industrial concentration has become a major focus of public policy. And I'll just start by giving two very pertinent examples. Uh, the first is uh, President Biden's uh, antitrust executive order uh, released in July 2021, which expressed his administration's intent to use the antitrust laws to combat excessive concentration of industry in the United States. The second example, uh, is the very recent announcement by the Federal Trade Commission uh, and the Department of Justice that they would be launching an investigation into the merger guidelines. Uh, and that investigation has been motivated uh, primarily based on concerns about rising industrial concentration. Now, this concern over industrial concentration can really be traced back to three sources. The first uh, is an academic analysis uh, done by Sam Peltzman, a professor at the University of Chicago, looking at changes in concentration in the US manufacturing sector. The second uh, is an economy-wide analysis uh, done by The Economist magazine uh, released in 2016. And the third, also from 2016, uh, was an analysis done by the Council of Economic Advisors. Now, it's been widely recognized in antitrust circles that these studies are of limited use uh, from the perspective of investigating monopoly and market power uh, because they look at industrial concentration. 
That is the level of concentration within an industry as defined by the US Census Bureau, uh, rather than market concentration. That is concentration calculated using market shares in properly defined antitrust markets based on uh, consumer substitution patterns. Now this idea that there is excessive concentration is really based on three assumptions. Uh, the first is that concentration in the US economy is rising. The second is that concentration in the US economy is persistent. And what I mean by persistent is that rather than being transitory, uh, high concentration has become an, a structural aspect of the US economy. And then third uh, is the assumption that rising concentration is economically harmful. So in our research, uh, we examine each of these hypotheses using economic census data from 2002 to 2017. Now this analysis looks at concentration both in the US manufacturing sector and also economy wide. Uh, and the reason I do this is because manufacturing is of specific interest, both because it's been widely examined in the academic literature, but also because the census data measures concentration in manufacturing using what's called the herfindel hirschman index or HHI, which is the preferred measure of concentration uh, among economists. And in fact, the DOJ and the FTC use HHI uh, in merger reviews. And for instance, uh, an HHI of 1500 or less is considered to be an unconcentrated market, or that is one that is highly competitive. Now for the rest of the economy, we don't have HHI data from the census. So the best measure we have is what's known as the uh, four firm concentration ratio or CR4, which looks at the amount of economic activity accounted for uh, by the top four firms in an industry. Now, despite the fact that we have these two different measures of concentration, what we see here is that the general trend in concentration is quite similar, uh, regardless of how we look at it. That is concentration is generally declining by either measure since reaching a peak in 2007. Starting with the manufacturing data, we actually see that concentration has been declining since 2002. Uh, and that the decline is about 150 HHI points. Uh, in 2002, average HHI was approximately 770, whereas by 2017, HHI was approximately uh, 620. Now, given that these are, as we discussed earlier, uh, already sort of unconcentrated levels, that's quite a significant decline in HHI. On the other hand, for the economy-wide results, what we see is from 2007 to 2017, CR4 uh, decreased by about 1.7 percentage points. And so the 2017 level of concentration is actually approximately equal to the 2002 uh, level of concentration as a result. Now, turning to the question of persistence, what we're looking at here is a chart that looks at changes in mean concentration for groups of industries classified by their 2002 level of CR4. Overall, what we see here is that trends in concentration depend very much on the initial levels of concentration. On sort of the left-hand side of the figure, we see that high concentration industries uh, tend to become less concentrated. Whereas on the right-hand side of the figure, what we see is the less concentrated industries tend to become more concentrated. That is, there is a distinct tendency towards mead reversion in the concentration data. Now, turning to the question of the relationship between uh, industrial concentration and economic outcomes, what we're looking at here is the relationship between CR4 uh, and industry changes in industry sales, the percentage of industry employment, and the percentage growth of uh, industry employee compensation measured as payroll per an employee. And what we see in the data is that rising industrial concentration is actually strongly associated with uh, increased output, increased job creation, uh, and increased compensation. There is no general trend towards increasing industrial concentration in the US economy from 2002 to 2017. In fact, it is declining. As for the second question, the evidence does not support claims that industrial concentration is persistent. Actually, what we see in the data is a marked tendency for the most concentrated industries to become less concentrated over time. 
Thanks, Robert. That was really fascinating. I think this is some really interesting and important things for policymakers to pay attention to. Uh, you made you you talked about it a little bit. You're, there's a, a trail of a, a, a research that has been done on this topic in the past. How does your research, how does your report build and improve upon that past research? Well, I think there's really two, two uh, important ways that we've built on the previous research. Uh, the first is that this study is incorporating the most recent data, the 2017 economic census data, which was released relatively recently uh, and was not incorporated in the previous research. I think the second thing is that in addition to looking to just looking at trends, as I sort of emphasized in the presentation, we're looking at the issue of persistence and also on, on economic outcomes. So in addition to finding that concentration is not, is not rising, but actually declining, we also show that there's actually a strong tendency for the most, con the most concentrated industries to become less concentrated and that uh, you know, increasing concentration is actually associated with economic growth uh, in the data. Yeah, I, I found those findings absolutely fascinating. Of course, you're, so you do show that, that concentration is not rising and might be declining in the economy. But of course, there are pockets, there are industries where we do have increasing com, uh, concentration. Uh, but they're kind of interesting stories. Tell us a, about a few of them, uh, retail and taxi and the rideshare industries. Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you asked that, Curtis, because that's an aspect of the research that I didn't really get to go into in the presentation. Uh, as your question uh, sort of alludes to, we... Uh, in addition to sort of looking at the general trend, which is a declining trend in concentration, uh, individual industries and groups of industries do, uh, you know, sometimes show increasing concentration. Uh, and probably the most prominent example in the data is the retail industry. Um, and where we see in retail is an overall average increase in concentration of about five percentage points on a CR4 basis. So the question is, what's driving that increase in concentration? If you look at the data, it turns out that that effect is really being driven by some very large increases in CR4 in some very specific industries. That is retail industries that focus on selling specialized products. And so what I mean by that are industries like the hardware store industry, the sporting goods store industry, uh, and you know, for instance, the pet store industry. There, what's happening is those industries are experiencing increases, particularly large increases in CR4, but that actually reflects increasing competition as those industries are facing very stiff and increasing competition from uh, generalized big box retailers uh, and also from e-commerce. So here what we have is increasing concentration as a symptom of increasing concentration, not decreasing, uh, increasing competition, not decreasing competition. Now, another really sort of interesting example just like that is what's going on in the taxi industry. Uh, in the data from 2002 to 2017, the taxi industry actually has one of the largest increases in CR4, about 59 percentage points. So does that represent a dramatic lessening of competition? No, it's actually quite the opposite. What's happening over this period is that local taxi monopolies are unraveling as competition from ride hailing platforms is increasing consumer access and lowering prices for consumers. Yeah, really, it's really fascinating stuff, and it's kind of counterfactual. It's, it's not necessarily what people would anticipate. Let's wrap this up by, uh, by looking at from a high level. What does this mean for policymakers? What does your research mean for policymakers as they try to tackle the issues of concentration? And what should guide their, their policymaking as, as, they, as they do that? And, and lastly, what could happen if they focus solely on measures of concentration rather than the economic markers that we all care about, economic growth, innovation, job creation, wage growth, and all those things that matter in our day-to-day -day lives. Well, I think this research really builds on prior work that shows that it's really necessary for antitrust policy that it be based on a rigorous economic analysis of actual markets and the actual behavior of firms within those markets, rather than in trends in industrial concentration or, or other ambiguous data. Guided by economics, antitrust is an important tool for ensuring that markets perform efficiently, uh, promoting economic growth and consumer welfare. But if antitrust policy is guided by concerns about industrial concentration, not only do we risk having a policy where we miss the biggest threats, the true threats to the competitiveness of the US economy, but we also risk uh, 
discouraging or even stifling uh, economic growth, job creation, and innovation. Uh, and that's precisely the opposite of what antitrust uh, policy is designed to do. Really well said. We'll be on the lookout for your, your paper to come out in the, in the near future. And we thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kulik and Curtis for your engaging presentation. Our next guest is a small business owner who recently went through the merger and acquisition process. She was a co-founder of an innovative healthcare group called Nightlight Pediatric Urgent Care based in Houston, Texas, before they were acquired by Mednax National Medical Group in March 2021. She is here to share her insights from her experience. Please welcome Zawadi Bryant, President of Acute Care Pediatrics for Med Mednax. Thank you for being here today, Zawadi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sorry for the technical errors on <laughs> David's part. So thank you for your flexibility as I jump in. Um, let's jump right into the questions. To start off our conversation, can you tell us, tell the audience a little more about Nightlight Pediatric Urgent Care and your journey through the acquisition process? Sure. Um, Nightlight, we started in 2007 with uh, my business partners, Anastasia Gentles, who is a pediatrician, and our nurse, who is uh, Connie Casares, we started. And it was really a vision that Dr. Gentles had as she was working in the pediatric emergency room that children and parents should have a better um, option other than the emergency room and their child has a sickness or illness, there's no real, there's no need for them to be in an emergency other than nothing else is open. And so it was her idea to open up an, urg an urgent care just for children. And um, we did that with a small location um, next to a Baby's R Us in Sugarland, right outside of Houston. And within a couple of months, we were doing very well. So we knew we had something that was um, attractive and very valuable to parents and to kids and to also pediatricians. They were referring their patients to us. And, um, you know, people were asking us, why don't you guys add a location where I live? And so we had people traveling to Nightlight from as far as Galveston, which is, you know, 50 plus miles from where we were. So we knew we had something that was attractive to, to people that did not want to spend hours upon hours in the emergency room for something as simple as a cold cough, flu or fever. That's amazing. Um, so as a small business owner trying to scale, why was a merger and acquisition an attractive option for you and how has it affected your business growth as a result? Yeah, so we, um, over the last uh, 15 years, we grew from that small location next to Baby Zara's in Sugarland to eight locations throughout the greater Houston area. And so we started looking in the industry and started seeing the growth that was happening with other urgent cares. And um, we realized that, you know, opening one or two clinics every other year really wasn't going to be competitive. And so in order for us to be competitive, we had to look at other sources of capital. So we looked at, you know, private equity, we looked at angel investors, we looked at strategic buyers, we were looking at the full gamut of options for us to acquire more capital for growth and uh, mergers and acquisitions um, started to look really attractive as we looked at merging with other urgent care um, networks or merging with a strategic buyer. And we ended up learning about Metnex as they reached out to us and we started talking about our mutual vision, which was very similar, um, putting the um, patient quality first. And they had a wonderful infrastructure already, a national brand, and um, we could do a lot of synergistic things together. And it just started to make sense that, you know, they had the infrastructure, they had the capital to allow us to grow. And so at this point, Right now, we're um, growing and expanding within our Houston market, and we're looking at several other major metropolitan areas throughout the country to add clinics this year. And our goal is to add 100 plus clinics over the next three years. So as you can see, you know, we had much slower growth on our own over the last 14 years. But over the next three years, we really believe we have a winning 
um, a winning formula um, to attract parents and kids and something that's going to be appealing and attractive across the country. Awesome. So it sounds like the acquisition process allowed you to really scale and provide a better service to your um, to your patients, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice for entrepreneurs preparing for a potential acquisition or merger? What information should they have at the beginning? Um, can you explain a little bit about that for us? Yeah, it's definitely a learning process. It's definitely something that you have to invest time and energy into. And I was very fortunate. I participated in several different small business programs like the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program, the Ernst & Young Winning Women program, and um, you know, inner city capital connections, ICCC. So uh, learning the terminology, learning who the players are um, in the industry, understanding the dynamics of working with a private um, uh, private equity partners, understanding the mergers and acquisitions terminology, knowing your business is really important from the beginning, knowing your numbers, um, learning the terminology like your enterprise value, what is your EBITDA, what are the multiples in your industry, because you really want to have a goal of exiting or you know a plan of how you're going to merge with another company, just understanding how your company looks, really looking at your company from a buyer's perspective, being critical of your business, you know, how is your profitability, you know, um, how knowledgeable and skilled is your staff and your management team. So when you go and you learn and research what people are looking for, you become better educated and better knowledgeable how to Turn your business, which really is an asset, into something that's going to um, generate not only um, capital for you and dividends for you as a business owner, but also for you know generational wealth or you know what whatever your next venture may be. So I really encourage people to do your research, understand your business, and understand the uh, mergers and acquisition industry. Those are all great lessons for um, budding entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs out there who are looking to, to grow their business or scale their business mm -hmm. or sell their business in the near future. So Zawadi, thank you so much for sharing your experience and perspective with us today. Um, our next guest sat down with Chamber Executive Vice President David Hirschman um, for a con conversation earlier this week. He advises businesses going through their own transformations, including mergers and acquisitions. Um, and as the former majority leader in the House of Representatives, he knows more than anyone about the importance of uh, the role of Washington plays in creating a pro-growth atmosphere for the private sector. Eric Cantor, uh, Vice President and Managing Director at Moles, Mollis and & Company and former Congressman um, from Virginia. So thank you. David, it's great to be with you. So let me start by asking you to say a little bit more about Molus and uh, what it does and what your role is at the uh, investment bank. Sure. Well, at, at Molus & Company, uh, what we do is we, uh, we provide solutions to our clients uh, in whatever situation they find themselves in. And obviously right now, uh, during this very uncharted waters of the pandemic, as we're coming out of the pandemic, as we've got political winds blowing in Washington, uh, there are some real challenges that our clients face as well as opportunities. Uh, so we advise clients um, in terms of trying to optimize solutions and their positions in the marketplace, whether that's through capital structure uh, adjustment, whether that's through acquisition, perhaps a client wants to uh, expand their product offering, perhaps they witness the technological revolution that we're undergoing right now and want to acquire some talent, want to provide some more innovation to the way that they operate, you know, any number of things. And, you know, if we run into a situation where uh, perhaps we see an uptick of interest rates, uh, Molson Company also has um, one of the global uh, leading global restructuring franchises. So as you say, globally, uh, we're in 23 offices around the world. Uh, we have a, a main presence is here in the U.S., uh, but certainly look to try and help um, our clients compete on a global scale. 
So I don't know anybody that meets with more CEOs or C-suite leaders or board members at companies around the world than you do. What are you hearing from them in terms of why M&A is such an important part of creating strategic opportunities for companies in a way that that contributes to employment, contributes to the overall economic growth, and helps particularly now during this crisis? I think all of us are, are taking a step back and certainly management boards are saying, hey, where do we sit as a company? How does our position stack up uh, uh, in terms of competition? What do we need to do to make sure that we enhance our product offering, that our end user, whether it's for a good or a service, uh, is satisfied and even then some so that we don't lose the business traction that we had. And so all of these factors in the digital age have contributed to a desire to transact. Uh, and again, I think uh, companies will transact for any number of reasons. You know, we will advise a company perhaps on optimizing their portfolio. Perhaps they'll need some cash that they want to redeploy elsewhere. Well, that'll create a divestment opportunity. And so for another company, they'll say, hey, we want to acquire that particular unit of this larger company so that we can grow our product offering. Uh, so again, there and for any number of reasons, I think companies look to M&A um, um, for growth, yes, but also to make sure that they are doing what they need to uh, for their constituencies, their, their stakeholders, whether it's their shareholders um, or the mission that they're about for their employees uh, and, um, and customers. What strikes me is that each of the reasons you laid out are really ways that companies become more competitive. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that intersection between M&A and enhancing competitiveness. Right. Well, again, I think right now it's uh, there is a race for innovation. I mean, even if you are an industrial company uh, and that you know you are faced with um, you know competition uh, that is global, uh, you want to make sure that you have scale in order to compete globally. Uh, you know, M&A will allow uh, companies to increase efficiency, they'll increase productivity, uh, they'll be able to uh, access new markets through M&A. Uh, and so those are the type of things that uh, we do every single day, and especially for the multinationals that we deal with. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fierce world out there, especially in the digital age. Markets that the U.S. has traditionally uh, competed in, whether it's Europe or uh, in, in the Middle East or Central Asia or even Africa, these markets are being inundated by the likes of China uh, and, and other sort of adversarial type of players. Uh, and I think it is in the interest not only of our clients, but certainly of the U.S. that we see U.S.-based multinationals be able to compete and win. Everything you describe is about an environment where consumers will benefit from increased choices and competition. And that's contrary sometimes to the narrative around M&A that, that you hear in Washington. Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no question. And I think, you know, what we're seeing right now, David, and you know this better than anyone, uh, as you track all this and advise uh, the members of the chamber on how to best navigate the the challenging winds that we're facing in terms of a regulatory prospect here in Washington. Uh, as, you, as you know well, the, the uh, antitrust forecast uh, is somewhat in question now, given where the Biden administration is going at the FTC and the DOJ. You know, with the recent announcement that the merger rules will be rewritten uh, and it'll take a year for us uh, to see what that looks like, you know, that provides some uncertainty. Uh, and so right now, I think, you know, from our standpoint at Mollison and Company, we're seeing the deals from maybe a billion to 10 billion right now continue. And I think a lot of this is being driven um, in what we call the sponsor arena from the alternative asset managers, private equity and others uh, to continue to provide for um, the, the capital that uh, that undergirds the deal flow. Uh, but when you get into the larger cap and strategic transactions, um, certainly C-suites and boards are taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, do we know we can make it through in terms of uh, the review and the M&A scrutiny or the antitrust scrutiny that comes from Washington? Uh, but, you know, you can see any number of reasons why companies will want to 
uh, will, will want to transact. Um, I thought it was interesting. I think most of us know what uh, IKEA is and the furniture and home goods maker uh, out of Sweden. Um, and if you want to think about sort of creative mergers, what they did is they went and bought enormous amounts of forestry uh, in the Balkan states. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to control the quality um, of their supply chain uh, in manufacturing the furniture. They wanted to do it in an in a environmentally sensitive way, but they wanted to be assured that they could have an end product that their consumers would like and that they could grow with. Again, a need for vertical uh, uh, merger that came about. Uh, and it wasn't just for growth sake. These are companies that are interested in providing for their clients and their customers and the maintain com competition. Uh, you know, I, I think here at home, what we see is um, in companies in the same industry will look to say, hey, we want to be competitive. We want to be there for our employees, for our vendors, for our clients. Um, and in, in the industry that's so close to Washington, uh, lately we saw the United Technologies and the Raytheon merger. You know, that, that is a merger that occurred because you had two defense companies realizing that they needed to step up uh, and be able to compete globally. So the right M&A, whether it's vertical or horizontal, can help you compete and can help you compete more quickly, which is exactly why uncertainty over even the timing of approvals and of a merger uh, make the economics very different, right? That's what, uh, that's what contributes to kind of the pause that, that, you're, that you just outlined. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I worry about the rhetoric that comes out of the White House and the administration pretty consistently now, and it's very adversarial towards business, towards investors that undertake risk when they put capital to work. I mean, the, these type of transactions and capital allocation doesn't just happen uh, by nature. It, it is a calculated move on the part of the investor, whether that's a retail investor or an institutional investor or a company. Uh, and when the administration says, we just don't like big companies, and by definition, big is bad, that's, that's just harmful uh, to the growth of our economy and ultimately to the standard of living for all of us. Because if you think about it, you know, so many Americans, millions, tens of millions of Americans have their life savings in their 401k plans, have their uh, pensions tied up in these big pension plans, whether they're private or they're state pension plans. Well, guess what? These pension plans are invested largely in U.S. companies. Uh, and if the, the administration makes a decision that they just arbitrarily say, well, this is too big and there's not enough companies in this particular sector, so we need uh, to do X, Y, Z uh, and to, to break up what is there, what you end up doing is you're costing the American retiree or pensioner um, a return. So again, I think the, the holistic view um, that seems to be absent on the part of this administration is what is causing some concern running through the decision making in the boardrooms and the C suites of US companies right now. You know, what I heard you say is not it, the companies relentlessly looking just to get bigger, but companies almost for individual unique reasons trying to compete better on the war for talent, technology, markets, you know, uh, almost bespoke to each individual company you work with? No question. I think that, um, you know, we, we believe in free markets. We believe in capitalism and companies want to win. And we ought to provide for a competitive playing field um, so that they can do that. And by winning, what I mean is the outcome is better good or service for the consumer uh, better prices for the consumer, and we only get that through real competition. So I don't know if the administration would differ with that, but the problem is, you know, they've arbitrarily in certain instances decided uh, that certain sectors um, uh, have um, not enough players. And, and I just don't know if Washington is the best arbiter of how many is enough, how much market cap is enough. Uh, and again, I worry about their view and the president's view of the dynamism of our economy. You know, if you if you look at it, um, it it's a, we have a pretty amazing um, economy that, you know, it's not as if you have big companies that sort of stay big. 
you know, we are dynamic in this economy that we have. And if you take a look for the average length of time for a company that was on the S&P 500 back in the 70s, let's say, I think the average length was 30 or 35 years. Today, it's 20 years. If you take a look at another uh, uh, sort of measure um, to see whether we are a healthy, dynamic economy or whether we just have big intransigent uh, monopolies in place, uh, you look at the, the participation in the top 10 by market cap in the S&P 500. Uh, if, you, if you look at that, um, the, the number of companies that are today the top 10 by market cap, only one of them was there in that top 10 10 years ago. Similarly, if you go 10 years before that, only three of those companies were in the top 10. Um, so again, I, I think the administration is a little bit wrong footed when they start to talk about the fact that we don't have a dynamic and growing economy. And in fact, coming out of this pandemic, uh, the number of business startups has shot way up 20 percent in years 20 and 21 or the number of increases uh, percentage wise of small of, of new business startups. Even before that, we were experiencing a 7 percent uptick in the number of startups. All this, David, means to me that we have a healthy economy, that competition in the free markets will allow us to grow, will allow our U.S.-based companies, both private and public, to compete. And ultimately, as I said before, our, the health of our economy, uh, the strength of our currency is inextricably tied to our country's national security. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. I think you've done an extraordinary job both explaining the competitive environment companies operate in here and globally, and the role that M&A plays in making them even more competitive for a whole variety of reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I'm pleased to turn it over to Neil Bradley of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Hello, I'm Neil Bradley, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer here at the Chamber. Thank you for joining us today for our second installment in our competition series, a competition in the marketplace. You know, throughout this series, we're exploring how competition fuels our economy, helps us grow and create prosperity, and helps the U.S. achieve its position as a global leader. Today, our focus was on competition in the markets because as our CEO and President Suzanne Clark said in her State of American Business, we know markets work. They enable businesses and industries to evolve, disrupt, compete, and to serve customers and solve problems and strengthen our society. You know, for the better part of four decades, there's been a bipartisan consensus when it comes to competition and antitrust policy focused on lowering costs for consumers and expanding access to competition and choice. Unfortunately, some in the Biden administration and on Capitol Hill want to upend this four decades of consensus in favor of a radically different approach, an approach that, in the words of the new chair of the Federal Trade Commission, focuses on structural incentives and the distribution of power and opportunity in our economy. In other words, a classic government knows best approach to regulation. We hope today's program has helped you understand a little bit better about how the chamber is working to fight back and to defend the free enterprise system and American consumers. A special thank you to FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips, who joined us today to share his vantage point as a member of the Federal Trade Commission about what's going on in competition policy. Dr. Robert Kulik of NERA brought to us his cutting research that belies the notion that our economy suffers from excessive concentration. You know, where the rubber meets the road on these issues is really main streets across this great country. And we're especially grateful that Zawadi Bryant joined us today, who shared her experience as an entrepreneur, a small business owner, who ultimately realized her dreams by selling her company so that she could achieve scale to bring services to children and families all across Texas. And Eric Canner, the Vice Chairman and Managing Director at MOLUS, uh, helped us understand 
that what Zawadi shared is a story that's true across the United States and across all hosts of industries. We hope you'll join us next week, same day, same time, for the third installment of our competition series, Competition for Ideas, Promoting Civil Discourse in Business and Government. That's Tuesday, February 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Until next week, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.